Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. Joy is all about Jesus first, others second, yourself last. Now our culture inverts that. Do your own thing. Don't let anybody get in the way. Go for it. If you want to know the joy of the Lord, then like Jesus, you need to self-empty yourself. And that's the challenge here. And it marks Paul's life. And it needs to mark my life and your life, doesn't it? the best relationships in life involve some measure of self-sacrifice. Perhaps you've given up a free afternoon or taken a friend or family member to the airport. Or maybe you've spent hours caring for a child or elderly friend. Well, today on Know the Truth, we'll look at another example of sacrificial giving in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. We're continuing our series called Classic Christianity. We're studying the book of 1 Thessalonians here on Know the Truth. And our teacher is Philip DeCourcy. Let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We've been working our way through this third chapter. The context is that Paul could wait no longer. Remember, he hasn't been able to return to Thessalonica. Satan has hindered him. That was the message of the tail end of chapter 2. But since he couldn't wait any longer, he sends Timothy to Thessalonica to learn of how the church is doing. And the word that comes back upon Timothy's Return is that the church is strong. They're standing fast in the Lord. And Paul wants to continue to encourage them to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. The preceding chapter ends with Paul's gushing affection for the Thessalonians. He says, you're my crown, you're my glory, you're my joy. And given that, then as we come into chapter 3, we'll understand Paul's struggle. Because twice in the opening five verses, he says, when I could endure it no longer, I sent to know of your faith. He's like an anxious father pacing the floor of the waiting room in the maternity unit, wanting to know how his wife is and is the child healthy. Reminds me of the story of the man who was in that exact position, walking up and down the waiting room, just wondering how things were going in the delivery room. Until after what seemed like an eternity, a nurse pokes her head through the door and says, Mr. Smith, I'm glad to tell you, your wife's well and have you a beautiful baby girl. He sighs with relief and then he says, well, thank God for that. She'll never have to go through what I've gone through. (laughs) That's Paul's kind of picture here. He's anxious. He's holding his breath. He's dying to hear what is going on. When you get to verses 6 through 9, when Timothy comes with the report, we read in verse 8, and he says, and then when he told us you were doing okay, then I really lived. It was like there was this big collective. They're standing fast. Well, that's encouraged them to be established in their faith all the more. You've got to love the love Paul has for them. There's this almost symbiotic relationship between Paul and his converts. What goes on with them determines his mood and prevailing state of being. There's passion here. There's a preoccupation here that I think is a challenge. On the one hand, it's a challenge to every pastor and elder and any man who calls himself a shepherd. Ministry is not a button you can switch on and then switch off. It's something that you bind your life to, that affects you viscerally, emotionally, in your spirit. There's something here in Paul where he carries about the people of God in his heart. And he's like this anxious father. I can endure it no more. How's the baby doing? And like the nurse poking her head through the door, Timothy comes back and says, they stand fast, Paul. The baby's smiling in your direction. They want to see your face. And Paul just grins from ear to ear and is relieved. That's challenging to me. You've got to love the way Paul loves the church. But I think there's an even more particular application here. This not only says something to the pastor, it says something to the evangelist. 
It speaks of the need for follow-up in evangelism. You know, Paul couldn't stop thinking about them. He left there against his will. He's moved on. He's done ministry already in Athens and nice, situated in Corinth. But his mind and his heart keep moving back in their direction. Not just as a pastor, but as an evangelist. He's had a hand in, in seeing them one to the Lord Jesus Christ. They have turned from their idols to God. They're serving God. They're living for Christ. They're waiting for Jesus to return from heaven. And so for Paul, evangelism involved follow-up. Evangelism is more than making a decision. It's about making a disciple. Matthew 28 tells us that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we're to make disciples of all nations. We're to baptize them. And we're to teach them the things that Jesus Christ commanded. And an evangelism must include all of that. That's why in Acts 14, when Paul's kind of done his first missionary journey, he turns around and he heads back to some of the churches he had established. And we read in Acts 14, 21, these encouraging and challenging words. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, telling them that through many tribulations they will enter the kingdom. Did you notice the language all there? It's very reminiscent of where we are in chapter 3. He sent Timothy to what? Establish, strengthen them, encourage them. He reminded them, you're appointed to this. You're appointed to tribulation. Paul is following the Thessalonians up. And that's what evangelism must include. We've got to avoid the scalp mentality. Evangelism involves more than pointing someone to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe God has given you the privilege of of watching a new birth, of seeing your child or seeing a friend or a family member or a work member come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a marvelous moment, isn't it? When you see them pass from death unto life, when you see the penny drop and the work of the Holy Spirit open their blind eyes, that's a wonderful thing. And you hear that first cry of one of the lambs of Jesus Christ. But listen, that's only the beginning And many of us have fallen down on the job, haven't we? We take great enthusiasm in that we've been part of that. And we spend no time wasted in telling others, Hey, did you know John came to Christ? Did you know Sally came to Christ? And then we kind of sit back and we take great pride in that. That's a failure if that happens. We've got to own that baby. We've got to make sure the baby gets fed the sincere milk of the word. We've got to make sure that that baby is is nurtured and protected against a wolf-like world and a ravenous enemy who goes about seeking whom he may devour. The evangelist, the person that God uses to win someone to Jesus Christ, must be more than an obstetrician. They must be a pediatrician. They must care for the child. If you and I win someone to Jesus Christ and don't follow up and either personally get involved in their life or make sure they get into a discipleship relationship, in evangelistic terms, it's like leaving a child on the doorstep of a hospital. Well, here you are. I really can't handle this or I, you know, it's not my concern. I know that's not our heart at Kindred. We long to mature disciples in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope this is a challenge to renew our effort to make sure that those that God sends our way who are new in Christ or those who come to Christ here at the church find discipleship relationships to help them grow. Paul challenges us about that, doesn't he, here in this whole thought, to see that person who made a decision become a disciple. That's true evangelism. Paul's struggle, Paul's sacrifice, Paul's sending of Timothy came at a cost. Go back to verse 1 and read through to verse 2. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. I want you to notice the word left in verse 1. Interesting word. It's a word that means bereavement. It's a word that means bereavement. This is a strong word. It's a very um, engaging image, isn't it? 
Paul says, look, I sent Timothy to you. The result, I was left in Athens bereft. I felt like I just lost someone dear to me. That's the emotion involved here. Let me kind of paint in the background. Paul uh, had left Silas and Timothy in Berea after the missionary team had left Thessalonica due to persecution. He had gone on down to Athens. On his arrival in Athens, he summons them, Timothy and Silas, to join him. You can read about that in Acts 17, verses 14 through 15. Then, in Athens, the team makes a decision. Hey, we've got to find out how this fledgling church is doing. And so the team agrees, Timothy, you got to go back. And that's what happens. There in Athens, Paul sends Timothy back to Thessalonica. You read about that in this passage here, 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 1 and 2. Then according to the book of Acts, Paul moves on down to Corinth, and then Timothy joins them there, tells them that things are good, and then Paul writes the letter. But Paul lets us know, that out of a struggle, he sends Timothy, and that was a sacrifice. I was left bereft in Athens, and that was no place to be without your Timothy. That was a city that was not friendly to the gospel. Read about it in Acts chapter 17. Paul was provoked when he got there. There was so much idolatry and sin and wickedness. Then when he starts to preach the gospel, they mock him. They joke. They call him a seed picker wasn't easy to be in Athens and certainly was made harder by being alone. But there's a great point, isn't there? Look at verse 1 again. We thought it good to be bereft in Athens and sent Timothy. This isn't good for me. That's why he uses the word bereft, left. I'm bereaved. I really wish Timothy was here, but I'm willing to give him up so that you can be strengthened and comforted and encouraged so that you can stand fast in the Lord so that the tempter doesn't tempt you out of your faith in Jesus Christ. Paul accepted the burden of losing Timothy. He thought it was best to send Timothy. What was best for them was not best for him. But you see, when you're gospel-driven, when you're Christ-centered, when you think about the cross, that's what you do because that's what Philippians 2 is all about, isn't it? Let this mind be in you, which was also in the Lord Jesus, who, although he was God, didn't hold on to the privileges of heaven and the worship of the angels and the glory of the Father. But he submitted to the Father's plan. He came in the likeness of man. He came in the form of a servant. He became obedient unto the death of the cross. And that is used in Philippians 2 to remind us to think about others more than ourselves. In fact, we've got another example of Paul in that very passage. If you go into chapter 1, Paul uh, talks in about verse 19 about the fact, look, I'm in prison here. I'm not sure how, you know, this thing's all going to fall. But I think I might know deliverance through your prayers. But I want you to know, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If this thing goes south, you know, don't be mourning about me. Because to be with Christ is far better. By the way, that's how you need to understand verse 21. If life for you is Christ, then death for you is gain. Because what does death do? It brings us into the near presence of Jesus Christ. That's why if you're living for Christ, dying isn't the worst thing that can happen. It's actually one of the best things that can happen. And I've challenged myself often that when I think about my own demise... That prospect seems nearer and nearer to me. Can I envision death as gloriously as Paul? And if I don't, if it's not as easy for me to say as it was for Paul to say that's far better, then maybe there's something missing in my living for Christ. Because if I'm living for Christ, then death is gain. And Paul says that. But he says, hold on a minute. Well, I'm more than happy to slip out of here and be with the Lord Jesus, to remain in the flesh could bear fruit in your life. And therefore, I'm kind of caught in the horns of a dilemma. To be with Christ, far better. But you know what? Should I be released and God answer your prayer and I come back to you at Philippi, I'm more than happy to do that because then I can pour myself out like a drink offering on top of the offering and sacrifice of your faith. That's powerful. 
And why does Paul say that? Why does Paul do that? And why does he repeat it here in 1 Thessalonians 3? Because he was constantly thinking, let this mind be in me that was also in the Lord Jesus. Christian friendship is always marked by a love that puts the best interest of others before one's own. That's what Philippians 2 is all about. That's why I was taught in the Sunday school at Rothkill Baptist Church that joy is all about Jesus first, others second, yourself last. Now, our culture inverts that and tells us it's all about self-fulfillment. If you want to know joy, do your own thing. Don't let anybody get in the way. Go for it. But as a countercultural community, the church says, my goodness, you couldn't have got it more wrong. It's Jesus first, it's others second, it's yourself last. That's joy. That's what living is about. If you want to know the joy of the Lord, then like Jesus, you need to self-empty yourself. Jesus emptied himself so that others might be filled Jesus went naked so we could be clothed. Jesus went poor so we could be rich. That's the gospel, and that's the challenge here. And it marks Paul's life, and it needs to mark my life and your life, doesn't it? Let me close with this thought. Paul really here fights a temptation that marks the ministry. It's the sin of possessiveness. The sin of possessiveness. He exhibits a lack of possessiveness when he sends Timothy, and that's refreshing. Now, on the one hand, we've got to throw ourselves in the ministry, and that's what makes this a challenge because there's a fine line about taking ownership and falling over into possessiveness. When you put blood, sweat, and tears into a ministry or some element of God's kingdom, and then God wants to do something different with that that maybe affects you or doesn't include you, how are you going to handle that? Are you going to fight and win over the sin of possessiveness? Paul did here. Paul was willing to give up Timothy at a loss to himself. It would have been to Paul's advantage. Hey, you know what, Timothy? Hey, guys, that's a good idea. Silas might have said, you know what, let's send Timothy. Paul said, that's a good idea, Silas, but hold on a minute. And he's thinking inside his mind, ah, that's not good for me. But no, he gives Timothy up for the sake of the gospel, for the purpose of kingdom progression. I know as a pastor, every pastor fights with it, the temptation to hold on to people and to hold on to ministry. But it can get in the way. It can stifle ministry growth and kingdom expansion. Pastors can get very possessive of their staff. Churches sometimes don't get involved in church planting because it means giving up people and resources. It means the diminishing of something that's been building up. And sometimes some pastors struggle with that. They like the big numbers, the greater strength of those numbers and resources. But you know what? The thought of dividing and conquering the world, that's a struggle. And you get very possessive of ministry. It's a real problem. It's a real issue. And I think Paul is a, is a real antidote to that, isn't he? And hats off to every minister and every ministry that impoverishes themselves for the greater good of the church. As I was thinking about that, challenging myself, reflecting on some of my own ministry situations, past and present, the story of uh, John Wesley and George Whitfield came into my mind. When we think about Methodism, we often think about John Wesley as the founder. In many ways, historically speaking, that's true. But you've got to get behind that story. And that in the early Methodism, there was two leaders, John Wesley and George Whitfield. And then there came a parting of the way. There was a conflict over Arminianism and Calvinism. John Wesley was the Arminian. George Whitfield was the Calvinist. And while they tried to resolve that, it just didn't happen. And like anything, I'm sure there was faults on both sides. But it's interesting as a, as a kind of sidebar to that, as an application to this. Whitfield stood out of the way and basically gave... Methodism over to John Wesley and his brother Charles. But I want you to listen to these words by Whitfield. When those in his inner circle were saying to him, Hey, don't step aside. Here's what he said. I have no party to be at the head of. Through God's grace, I will have none. But as much as is in me lies, I will strengthen the hands of all of every denomination that preaches Jesus Christ in sincerity. 
Let my name be forgotten. Let me be trodden under the feet of all men. If Jesus may therefore be glorified, let us look above names and parties. Let Jesus be our all in all. I care not who is uppermost. I know my place, even to be the servant of all. Isn't that good? I care not who is uppermost. I know my place, even to be the servant of all. When I could endure it no longer, I thought it good Good for you, not good for me, to be left lonely in Athens, unfriendly to the gospel. But I sent Timothy to know of your faith. In the light of the cross, Paul said, I care not who's uppermost. I know my place. It's to be the servant of all. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we would pray for the sentiment of George Whitfield and the spirit of the Apostle Paul based on the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we can become very possessive of the things you have given us, whether that's material things or whether that's personnel and staff and resources within a church ministry. Lord, help us to be challenged to always have that big kingdom picture. Lord, help us to do those things that are best for others, for the servants of God, for the people of God, for the church of God. Lord, help us not to hold on to things that you need for your kingdom and glory. Help us to know our place. Help us to be the servant of all. Give us a love for the church that Paul had for the Thessalonians. Give us a thoroughness in our evangelism that moves from decisions to disciples. Give us a willingness to sacrifice so that ministry can grow, so that faith can be strengthened, so that lost people can be won. Lord, help us to look above parties and labels and be those who live and die for the church of Jesus Christ, the church he loved and died for. And we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. timely reminder to lay down our desires for the sake of those around us. You've been listening to Philip DeCourcy. I'm Wayne Shepherd, and this is Know the Truth. Today's message is part of a verse-by-verse study through 1 Thessalonians titled Classic Christianity. You can hear the complete series by visiting our website. That's ktt.org. Or download the free Know the Truth app. Or subscribe to Know the Truth on Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. All great options for flexible listening. Well, we're constantly looking for more ways to deliver Know the Truth to listeners like you, and we're grateful we can provide the content so widely without fees or barriers. But while we never charge anyone to listen, these programs aren't free to produce. That's where you come in. When you donate to support this ministry, you cover the costs of production and distribution so more people can join us as we teach God's Word with boldness, clarity, and conviction. Your support truly makes a lasting impact in the lives of those who listen. And to show our gratitude for your support, when you give today, we have a book we'd like to send you to help you find more encouragement from God's Word. It's titled Pathways to Peace. And the author, John Kitchen, offers a deep dive into Isaiah 40, a deeply refreshing passage for anyone feeling weary and weighed down. If you're longing to experience God's rest, you'll absolutely want a copy of this book. So be sure to ask for Pathways to Peace when you donate today. Call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. If you prefer to send your donation by mail, write to Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd for Philip DeCourcy. Be sure to join us next time for another message on humble service and the importance of persevering in good works, regardless if anyone sees or appreciates our efforts. That's Friday, right here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.